It's time for Baby and Toddler Instructions with host Blythe Lippman. Blythe is a nationally renowned infant and toddler expert who has over 30 years experience helping moms and dads regain their sanity, teaching them how to survive, and giving them the confidence they need to be the best parents ever. From sleeping to crying to potty training to choosing a preschool and so much more. If you're a parent, Baby and Toddler Instructions is the show you've been looking for. Now here's your host, Life Lippman. Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you might be. Thanks so much for tuning in to Baby and Toddler Instructions this morning. I cannot wait to talk to my wonderful guest in just a bit, Emily Willingham. She is the author with with, uh, Tara Haley. The book is called The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first four years. And boy, is it interesting. But first, as always, I have a few things to share. If you're listening live, you can always call us if you have questions, comments. Want to just say good morning. The number here is 877-864-864. 4869. And if you are listening to a podcast, you can go to find all the podcasts. I have done over 200 shows and they are all available at toginet.com, T O G I N E T.com, stitcher.com, iTunes, and of course my website, mybestparentingadvice.com. And if you're listening for the first time, I am the author of three books. Help My Baby Came Without Instructions, More Help, and Help My Toddler Came Without Instructions. And boy, do they make great gifts, especially this time of year with all the babies being hatched and the toddler siblings. Anyway, um, you can always contact me on mybestparentingadvice.com. Get a book if you have a question, if you want to be a guest on the show, or if you want to have your own show. That would be pretty cool. I love doing my show. Anyway, so let's see. Recalls. There were some that just came up this morning from last week. Fisher Price recalled the infant cradle and swings. When the seat peg is not fully engaged, the seat can fall unexpectedly. Yikes. Also, the flying tiger Copenhagen wooden toys, the uh, blocks and giraffes. The wooden toys can become detached, resulting in small pieces that can pose a choking hazard. And the Miniland Educational recalled the Muji plush toys, the red button on the toy's left pocket can detach, posing a choking hazard. And, you know, everything goes in the mouth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I have to say I am not thrilled with toys that have strings on them. You know, we always gave our little ones those, those little telephones to pull. And they're still on the market. And I have them in my infant room. But I cut the strings so they're very, very short. Because it takes a second for an accident. You know what? You don't want those strings, God forbid, around the baby's neck. I mean, your toddler's neck, a finger, your baby, if it's a baby toy. So if you go, again, to mybestparentingadvice.com, click on the recall page, and everything is there up to date. And please, please do not try to fix everything yourself. You know, they have the, I have the numbers, I have the website contacts, so you'll either get a refund or you'll get a new, a new toy for a replacement. But don't ever try to fix it yourself. You know, it just isn't safe. So let's see what else I have today. Oh, an interesting statistics from USA Today. There was an online survey of 1,000 Americans, and it said free pre-K. 77% of Americans think early education, including child care, should cost nothing. Well, you know what? I think that would be great. I think it's a great opinion. My question is, as a caregiver, as a teacher, who's going to pay us if it's free? Money has to come from someplace. And, you know, the government, we're always talking about raising the uh, the hourly wage. And I know some of the states have done it. But, okay, if you want to weigh in on that, send me. Go to, go to my Facebook pages, My Best Parenting Advice, Baby Instructions. I'm on Twitter. Tell me what you think. Do you think it should be free? And you can also call here at 877-864-4869. Also, I was reading the uh, New York Times on Sunday, and there was a really interesting article called A Better Breast Pump, Not a Milking Machine. Sixty years ago, excuse me, 60 years ago, a, a male Swedish inventor 
invented this breast pump that more or less has the same design. Okay, so I think it's great and we need breast pumps and maybe I should be quiet till I tell you about the rest of the article. But when a man inv invents a breast pump, does he try it? That's my question. Anyway, but for many women, this 60-year-plus design doesn't come close to stimulating breastfeeding. So indignation over the shortcomings, a lot of people have tried to invent new ones. There was a research paper. Let's see, the, the New York Times called for better design, prompted the MIT hackathon in 2014 called the breast pump, called Make a Breast Pump Not Suck which a thousand people put their ideas in and you know when I first saw the breast pump they thought it was a joke and it's really interesting because a lot of the breast pumps make so much noise and it's almost like women say it's like a cow so um, one dad he he built something out of washers a piece of plastic a latex glove some duct tape a syringe and a tube and he called this the smart pump by the Naya Health and it uses a water-based suction system that's more efficient and closely resembles the sensation of natural breastfeeding. Um, it feels more like you're nursing a baby than nursing a machine. And this is very cool. This particular pump communicates, of course, with your smartphone app, and it measures the milk output. And eventually, it's going to plan to sync with a smart baby bottle they're developing that gauges a baby's milk consumption. It's scheduled to go on sale this coming Friday, and yikes, it is $599. Also, there was another breast pump designed by somebody else from Baby Nation, and they did a Kickstarter campaign. And this breast pump is going to sell for $450, and it's a little different as well. Both the Naya Health and the Baby Nation received grant money, and as well as Baby Nation did, got $81,000 through a Kickstarter. Wow, that's pretty good. Anyway... Couple people, a lot of people are working on a new design for a breast pump so you don't feel like a cow, so it's not expensive. Oh, and the one thing with the Baby Nation breast pump, it's portable. They said you can walk the dog, you can be outside, you don't have to hide out in your car and plug it into the uh, lighter because you have a break at work to pump your breast milk. Anyway, stay tuned. If you want to see the entire article, look at the New York Times. Um, it was April 24th. And it was in the review section, so take a take a peek at that. I think it's great, and, you know, the breast pumps are so bulky, and, yes, they're expensive, and, yes, you can rent them, and I'm hoping that my guests can weigh in on this because they've done lots and lots of research about breastfeeding, about everything. So let me tell you – oh, one more thing before I introduce her. You know, as as you know, as I always say, I run an infant room in a preschool. My babies are six weeks to 12 months all 11 of them. So today I wanted to share a couple quick tips from help. My baby came without instructions. My chapter called Yikes. Is it time to go back to work already? Choosing the perfect preschool. <clears throat> First of all, there's no perfect as we know. Perfect is what works for us. And there's always going to be questions and there's always going to be things that are not the way you want them. But when you're looking for a preschool for your baby or your toddler, Go with your intuition, look at the appearance, see what it smells like, look what the teachers look like, are they smiling, ask if you can drop in whenever you want. If something doesn't fit your needs or something just doesn't feel right and you can't put your finger on it, you know what, choose another preschool because I can tell you in the mornings I have seen mothers cry for 40 years. It's so difficult to leave your babies and I've even had dads cry. You know, here's your little miracle, and it's scary to leave them. So you want to make sure when you walk out that door in the morning that you are not nervous all day, that you know you can get in contact with the school anytime, and that you know your baby is going to get the best care they can. So make sure you go with your intuition. The other thing is once you're enrolled, <clears throat> do – well, before you're enrolled, drop in. If you've chosen the preschool that you love – drop in a couple times because it's like our homes. When we know we're having company, what do we do? We clean. We put out the cookies. We make it beautiful. So if you chose one, drop in when they don't expect you and just, you know, say, I want to see what's happening during the day. And if, and if they don't like it, you know, if the babies are sleeping, I do have to say this from my teacher's point of view. If the babies are napping in the infant room and the lights are out and it's dark 
and lullabies are playing peek in through the window and if you want to talk to one of the teachers ask them to come out because i can say on the other side when i have a parent drop in which is fine anytime with me it's disruptive if a new voice is in the room when the babies are trying to sleep because they don't all sleep at the same time but do drop in and then once you do enroll your baby and it's time to drop them off once you get used to it don't hang out in the room a lot it makes it more difficult for you, especially if it's an older baby or if it's a toddler, your toddler may not let go of your leg and there'll be tears from everybody. So let the teachers do their jobs. You know, a kiss, give a kiss, give a hug, say have a great day. And you can always call the school and ask how the baby is doing. I know my room has a phone, so if a parent ever calls, I will answer and tell them exactly what the baby's doing. If I cannot get to the phone and I'm busy, my director will come down and ask me and I will give her a report or else I will call the parent back as soon as I can. But I know how tough it is and with many babies being born in the spring, I know they're born all year, but it seems like springtime there's a lot of babies, a lot more babies. You know, many of you are going to be looking for child care in six weeks, two months, so go with your intuition and enjoy every minute with those babies. So in just about a minute, <clears throat> we are going to go to our first break. And when we come back, I have the wonderful Emily Willingham with us. She's a research scientist and science journalist with her PhD in biological sciences from, from University of Texas in Austin. Yay, completed postdoctoral uh, fellowship in pediatric urology. And she's experienced about every breastfeeding complication, mastitis, thrust, tongue tie, and Tara Haley, her co-author, is a reporter, journalist. She retained, this is interesting, she had a retained placenta that required manual surgical extraction. I'm sure she's going to tell us, uh, Amy will tell us about that. Um, they have children. They're, they've written for the New York Times, Scientific American, Slate, Discover, Everyday Health, Forbes. I can't wait to talk to Emily after the commercial break because this book the Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first years is amazing. I wish I could take a picture. I have so many bookmarks in here. I mean, it is everything from pacifiers to breastfeeding to sleeping, you name it. They did research, and I just cannot wait to talk to Emily. So stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> We'll be right back with more help. My baby came without instructions. It's baby and toddler instructions with Blythe Lipman on Toginet. We'll be right back right after these. Close your eyes and imagine living your life without limits. Where would you go? Who would you meet? What would you do? During an Uncover Your Hidden Genius session, you will discover what's keeping you from living your life with purpose, passion, and fulfillment of your potential. You'll get a clear vision of the steps you need to take to uncover your hidden genius so that you can live a life without limits. Sessions can be done over the phone, Skype, or in person. Find out more at www.JoyceBufordEmpowers.com or by calling 903-287-0747. taking me to our special place to eat. Sweetheart, I took you to El Charo on the Ridge tonight because I know you love it, and I wanted this meal to be the very best. Oh, honey, those fajitas smell divine. I know, my dear. Everything about El Charo on the Ridge is wonderful, just like everything about you. Oh, my sweet, sweet man. I can't stand it any longer. Let's take our love of El Charo food and each other to the next level. Marry me, darling. Baby, you don't know how long I've waited for you to ask. Of course I'll marry you. As long as you promise to take me to El Charo's on the Ridge on Old Jacksonville Highway by Brookshire's Fresh. Anytime I want, I'll be yours forever. Welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lipman on Toginet. 
the hour for all moms with little ones to come for great advice, encouragement, and great ideas for all new parents. Now, back to the show with Blythe Lipman. Well, welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions. If you're just tuning in, I'm going to be talking to Emily Willingham, the author with Tara Haley, about the Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first years. And let me tell you, I, this book, I have so many bookmarks in this book. I don't like to write in books, so I put bookmarks. Anyway, it just this book has answers. It is so interesting. Emily, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. And Thanks. I am Thanks for very me. excited to have you here. And I just, I don't know where to start. Let's start. How did you come up with this? Because there's so much research and it's really interesting because like today I, you know, I talked about the breast pump and they did research at MIT and statistics about free child care. And, you know, I always say you have to take the statistics or the grain of salt or the studies? What do you think? Where did, how did you do this? How and why? Well, we, um, we came up with the idea in part because the two of us both write about these kinds of things. And one of the things we do is we try to bring clarity to things like um, the study about you know, preschool and the scientific findings that center on parenting. And we realized, you know what? I think that there's a need out there for people. People want this information. And so we thought it would be a good idea to have it in one place. And there was interest in that, and so we got to do it, which we were pretty pleased about. Well, you know what? How did you know where to start? Which, <laughs> where do you start? Do you start with pregnancy? Do you start right. with delivering the baby? And, you know, there's, there's all these things. I really want you to talk about the placenta because, you know, people are putting it in necklaces. People are <laughs> eating it. People are frying it. And, right. you know, I was reading your chapter this morning about how there really isn't well, you say, is there any study that says it actually helps? And Yeah, I mean, the placenta is just another organ. The interesting thing about the placenta is the only organ that we grow and then we actually get rid of naturally on purpose because it's just kind of an odd organ. But it is just another organ, so it's made of the same things that our other organs are made of. And there's not anything in particular that's special about ingesting it or using it um, for any purpose. And, no, there aren't any studies that indicate some benefit of doing that. But people – are people still really doing it? Is it so popular? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, think, I think so. I hear about that, and I have a friend who's still got a placenta in her freezer <laughs> from her. I think her son is now 15 years old, and she's still got one in her freezer. I don't think she's quite sure what to do with it. <laughs> so, I'm like, do you bring it out on Thanksgiving and make you know, <laughs> send a stuff? No, no. I think you know, maybe it's kind of you know difficult to you 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 had this baby, and this thing was your connection to the baby, right? And then you. You you deliver that as well. I mean, they talk about delivering the placenta. And maybe you yeah. just feel like I just don't want to let this thing go. You know, that was my first connection to a baby that I just had. So I think for some, you know, some people bury them under trees and things like that. And you know, we do all kinds of things with placentas. So I, you know, there's not that I know of any harm in encapsulating your placenta and taking it. But there aren't studies that show that there's some sort of huge benefit from it either. No, and you know, we're all different. People do things that work for them. I tell you, we're not supposed to judge, and it doesn't matter. It's just that when you see it, it's kind of gross. <laughs> it's, day. it's not like looking at a flower. <clears throat> You're right. It's not beautiful. I mean, I don't think any organ that you eject from your body is probably going to be, you know, it's not something you would want to see in your garden or anything like that. Uh -huh. But, yeah, yeah I think people have attachments to things, you know, and, yes, we are all different, which is you know, one of the themes of our book is, you know, everybody's different. We're all going to have kind of a different way of dealing with things. And for a lot of this stuff, there's not just one true way. And, you know, there will be things that work for some people that don't for others. So I know. I, I agree. Well, moving on, let's talk a little bit about choosing a pediatrician because I've had moms tell me, you know, I love my pediatrician, but I picked him or her when I was pregnant and now they don't really answer the phone or I can't get there. What do you think? Yeah, I think that 
I mean, one thing that you're going to run into probably anywhere is just that it's probably kind of hard to get in to see a doctor who's a generalist, right? I think so many of them are overwhelmed, and so there's that aspect to it. But if you're not happy with the pediatrician you have, you're not married. You don't have to go and have some kind of, you know, legal breakup with them. You can just look around and try to, I mean, you know, you have to, of course, go to, you know, the ones who are in network and all that kind of stuff, but talk to your friends, your social circles, say, who, whom do you like as a pediatrician and what do you like about them? And see if, you know, you can find things that are a match for you. Uh, because this is a really, this is an 18-year relationship yeah. that you're going to be having with your physician if you keep them. And, you know, it's important that you guys all can talk and eventually that your pediatrician will also be able to, you know, have you be simpatico with your child because they'll start talking to your child separately from you when they reach their teens and having conversations with them. So all of that's pretty important. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And, you know, I have people say, well, they're going to get mad at me. Why do you care? You know what? <laughs> if your pediatrician, if you don't, if you don't mesh, and it's not maybe in that you don't even like the pediatrician, if you don't mesh with what mm-hmm. your needs are, it doesn't matter if they're, they're too busy to care if they like you. I hate to say that, but they're so busy that they're not going to say, oh, remember Mrs. Jones? She wasn't very nice. She left. But pediatricians don't do that. But I have yeah. to say, you know, you're talking about the 18 year relationship and and if you're pregnant, you know, do the meet and greet. Go in and talk to the pediatrician. And two of the important questions are, are you available on weekends? And if I call and I need something after hours, who am I going to speak to? Am I going to speak to a doctor? Am I going to speak to a nurse practitioner? You know, whatever you need. The, the thing is, as you know, with children, they don't always get sick between uh, 9 and 5. <laughs> they get Almost sick never. between 12 and 4. <laughs> yes. and you know, does he, is there an answering service, and will you talk to a doctor or just somebody that, you know, tells everybody the same thing, which I've heard. So, you know what, and it's really good. I, I like this. I'm taking this bookmark out, out of the 10,000 <laughs> bookmarks I have in your book on that. Now, everything oh. you said is spot on, of course, yeah. We, we, everybody needs to scout it out beforehand. It was a mistake we made with our first son is that we actually failed to scout out a pediatrician because – None of the books told us that, the ones that we were reading anyway, and so we didn't know, and we were in the hospital, and we had no pediatrician um, to contact for you know, advice or input about what to do about a couple of things that had arisen in the hospital, and that was a huge mistake, so it's very important to scout this out before your child arrives and make sure that you have all of those questions you just mentioned answered to your satisfaction. Exactly. So look for those pediatricians. And I, I really love that you said, ask your friends because they know, you know what, they're going to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. They're not going to, they're mm-hmm. going to tell you what they like, what they didn't like. Um, I, I was playing with this when I was thinking about the show, whether we should talk about vaccine vaccines. It's, you know, it's such a hot topic. Yeah. It is a hot topic, and I think most of, most people come to it with a certain wariness, you know, not because of things that people have associated with vaccines necessarily, but just because you, know, you are getting this intervention for something that most of us have never even seen unless we're really old. You know, we haven't seen polio and measles and all and meningitis, most of us. And so you know, you're taking in your brand new baby, <laughs> right? And you're saying, okay, I'm going to let you put a needle in this fat little thigh, and that's going to upset my baby and that's going to upset me and I can't really connect the dots in my head for why how this works and why this is necessary and so I think it's really kind of daunting as a parent to do that I know that for all three of my children it was always just this kind of uh, you know coming into it with a certain level of trepidation about it and then leaving with a certain level of concern watching them you know will there be a fever will there be a reaction and all that stuff because as good as vaccines are at what they do you know, no intervention is without risk, and there can be, you know, side effects, adverse effects that people have in reactions. And so I completely understand why people have a lot of questions, and that's one reason you need to have a great relationship with your pediatrician so that you can talk to your pediatrician and get your questions answered. What about, what do you think, though, about the alternative schedule i mean i know it's it's very different than when my kids were little they gave them you know maybe one maybe two now you go in and the kids get like six things and 
that always made me nervous. And now as a grandma, I think, well, if they have a reaction, how do you know what they're reacting to? Because sometimes they need boosters. What do you think about the schedule, changing the schedule and spacing them out more, which many parents are doing now? Yeah, I know that people are and that that's being um, promoted. But the thing is, is that the vaccines are the evidence base for the vaccines suggests the timing that is already recommended for them because that is the point at which you can give the vaccine. It will provide the most protection and the most needed protection at the most vulnerable periods for the child. And so if you delay that, you're delaying that protection and you are going to reach a point where the child does have to get the vaccinations, which means you're looking at getting even more at a visit. Also, at every child visit, you are running the risk of your child being exposed to things that are vaccine preventable if they haven't been vaccinated. And so you're actually compounding a lot of risks with delay. And the evidence base is it favors not delaying and and going with the vaccine schedule. And one more thing is that while, yes, the number of shots has definitely increased, which means advancement, which means that we have found ways to protect against even more diseases that can cause disability and death, what nature responds to isn't the number of shots, but how much um, immune, how many immune triggers are present in those shots. And we actually now, children are exposed to thousands fewer immune triggers than they used to be because they've just refined the vaccine so well. You know, I'm, I'm glad you, you explained that because, you know, I know pediatricians will say they're still going to have to get the needle in the leg. Is it better to do it all at once. And yes, they may get a reaction. They may not, not all babies get fevers anymore. You know, it's, I think it's an all wives tale, not, you don't get a shot and then your baby's cranky for two days. Mm -mm. Sometimes they get nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's variable. And that's the most common reaction is to have a little bit of a sight reaction and maybe a little bit of a fever. And that's, that's the kind of usually it. So. Right. It's usually nothing worse. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so talk to, as, As Emily is saying, speak to your pediatrician if you're nervous, because yes, it is scary. And you know what? You don't want to see anybody put a needle in those little, Mm -mm. those little fat thighs. They're so cute. Mm -hmm. They're so cute. And it's so, you're just like, oh, I just don't want to look. Yeah. It's, it's real. It's, I'll tell you what, I didn't think this. I went to the doctor with my daughter. I have one grandson, as everybody knows, I say every week. (laughs) And I was there when he got his first shots and oh my gosh, I had to like not cry in front of my daughter because it made me feel so bad. Too. It's hard. I, I think it's really hard. It's one of the first early, you know, for if you have a healthy baby, it's one of the first early hard things that you have to do. Oh, you know? It really is. But yeah. the tough thing I have to do now is we're going to have our next commercial break. And when we come back, we have so much to talk to Emily about her book, The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first years. I just love it. So please stay with us. And call us at 877-864-4869 if you have a question or a comment. You know how I love callers. So stay with us. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more help. For help, my baby came without instructions. It's Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lipman on Toginet. We'll be right back right after these. Would you like to know how to bring more ease to all the decisions you need to make in life? Knowing your core values is the first step in Joyce's free live masterclass. You'll discover your top five core values in as little as 45 minutes. Join her now at freegiftfromjoyce.com. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Do you wake up not feeling great? Do you struggle with low energy during the day? Are you unhappy with your weight or your appearance? If you can say yes to any of these, then you need to know that you can change that. Now is the time to live your most excellent life. Not tomorrow, not next year, but now. You have the power to change how you feel and to increase your energy. You have the power to change your weight and your appearance. All it takes is exercise and healthy eating. How simple is that? By exercising daily, doing something you love, like walking outside or bike riding, you can assure that you are on the road to living your most excellent life. Continue in healthy eating and daily activity and choose to enjoy your life to the fullest. 
wake up in the morning and feel great. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. Welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lipman on Toginet. The hour for all moms with little ones to come for great advice, encouragement, and great ideas for all new parents. Now, back to the show with Blythe Lipman. Well, welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions. I'm here with my wonderful guest, Emily Willingham, who co-authored the book, The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first four years. She co-authored with Tara Haley, and the book is great, and there's so much to talk about. You know, I wanted, Emily, uh, talk a little bit about breast pumps. I know you have children. How old are your children? Um, My youngest son is nine and then I have two teens now which is still shocking to me one of them is 13 and one is about to turn 15. It goes so fast it really goes quickly so you know I talked about about many people coming up with new breast pump designs because they're noisy and whatever (laughs) what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm all for that because I had the Medela breast pump, which you know you said that I forgot how much you said that one was five hundred and something dollars. Five hundred ninety nine, yeah. Yeah, when we bought the Medela, I think it was about four hundred bucks, but that was back in two thousand two, I think. And yes, you feel like a dairy cow. You know, you hook yourself up just like a dairy cow, and then it makes this noise. You know, the noise it goes like that. And if you are, especially, you know, this was like 13 years ago, I was at work, and so you were consigned to a bathroom or someplace like that to pump, and you're sitting in the bathroom with this thing, and it's going, you know, it's just, yeah, I'm all for a quieter, uh, more effective, kind of more suckling-like breast pump all the way. I think that's a great idea. I do, too. You know, and this, the other one they were talking about is you can, it's, it's so compact, you know, I, so many moms, I'll have them come to school with breast milk, and they've pumped in their car. They connect mm-hmm. it to the lighter, and I'm thinking, this poor mom, you know what? She finally gets the break, and she has to sit in the car, especially in Arizona <laughs> in the summer. It's so hot. Uh, so Yeah, I'm from Texas, so I know exactly what you mean. And, yeah, and that stuff is like gold. I remember taking it oh, into yeah. my um, son when he was an infant. He was in a in an infant room and taking that in and just being like, don't. <laughs> throw away any of this breast milk this is so important you know it was just like gold it was so hard to get (laughs) it's gold and don't spill i can tell you i learned the hard way many years ago i spilled a bottle of breast milk a bag Hmm. of breast milk and i i really wanted to cry before i before i called the mom and ever (laughs) since you know what here's a tip if you're going to pour the breast milk out of a bag into a bottle put the bottle in a bowl so mm-hmm. if God forbid it spills, it's in the bowl and not down the drain. That's a great tip because, yes, it is tears to see that stuff go anywhere but inside the baby. Oh, <laughs> it is. It really is. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about, and this is such a hot topic and so scary, especially living in Arizona, guns in the home. They mm-hmm. just, you know, they just had, I, I hate to say TV, but Grey's Anatomy just had a whole thing about a little boy that found a, a mother's gun and it went off and... You know, we know how that goes. Yeah, um, it's interesting because I'm from Texas, and so, you know, there's, like I said, and, of course, there are guns and pretty much I can't even think of a home now in Texas where we would have visited where there wouldn't have been a gun pretty much. We didn't own them ourselves, but certainly friends and family. I mean, they're just ubiquitous. And um, there is this idea that if you teach children you know, gun safety, which we've always done, that this will be something that they can apply if they run into a gun by accident, they come across it in someone's house or in a drawer and that kind of stuff. But some researchers have done studies that indicate that in spite of pretty in-depth gun safety training, like in one situation it was for a week, I think, with the family and the kids and all this stuff, children from toddler to about age 12 their curiosity overrides that training just all the time. Like more than half of them, 75% of them, will just still pick up the gun, and some of them will even try to test it, try to fire it. They'll put enough pressure on the trigger to try to fire it. And so when it comes to guns and kids, that curiosity really seems to override any training that they've had in terms of gun safety. So that that's alarming <laughs> because you, know, you really want to hope that, 
with the teaching about guns. You know, don't point a gun at something you don't intend to kill and that kind of stuff. If you find a gun, get a grown-up immediately. That's out the window when their curiosity kicks into gear. It, it's true. I mean, they're curious about everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're in Texas. I'm in Arizona, and it's really scary. And I know some people that are working on a specific kind of gun guard that if the child mm -hmm. picks it up, it buzzes and it makes a noise. And, and you know what? There just needs to be more education in families, especially in our states that have so many guns in the families. And the question is, you know, do you show the child where the gun is? I had somebody say, I'm going to show my child where I keep the gun so they'll know not to touch it. And I went, no, 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 don't do that. No, don't do that. <laughs> that seems like an invitation just to go look at it. You know, I mean, they're just so curious. They're, they're, you know that. You can't. I mean, you know about the marshmallow test, right? You put a marshmallow in the room and you tell the child if you don't eat the marshmallow, you'll get two. And most of them can't keep themselves from eating the marshmallow. And, exactly. You know, yeah, impulse control is not in place in most kids for years and years. So, yeah, that seems um, like, you know, somebody not thinking that one through entirely, I think. No, it's scary. And I we could go on and on about this because... <laughs> Guns are here, and you know what? I hope they work on it so so many accidents don't happen. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's bad. Yeah. Moving on, let's go back to birth and delivery because you have a chapter in here. You talk about home birth versus hospital mm -hmm. birth. Right. What do you think? Um, let's see. I have had two hospital births with my middle son in 2002. We had a home birth, and that, of course, now is a long time ago. It's almost 14 years ago. And with my youngest son, we had a birth in the hospital. And what I found between my first and last hospital births was that hospitals have changed a great deal. And so any reasons I had in 2002 to give birth at home with a nurse midwife who had obstetrician backup and we were literally a couple minutes from a hospital, those kind of are gone. But everybody's rationales for these things are going to vary. And the issue in the United States is, is that there's no uniformity in terms of what's available by region or local area. There's no uniformity in terms of midwives their certification, what level of training they have, what relationships they have with obstetricians and hospitals. None of that is established and uniform, and there's not really an infrastructure for that in the United States. So when I was writing that chapter, <laughs> you know, when we were working on that and going back and forth about home birth and looking at the data, I was just thinking the Europeans have this model where they have this sort of family-centered delivery center that's directly associated with a hospital and women can go there they can give birth with midwives the hospital's right there something arises and that just seems like a really good standard of care because it involves everybody in the birth my first experience in hospital you know we i gave birth in one room with a lot of strangers <laughs> in there yeah i remember and then they that moved, yeah, yeah, and then they moved us, you know, to another room. They separated us from the baby, all this other stuff, and that was in 2001. By 2006, it was a family room. It was a delivery, labor, recovery, all in the same room. They were very particular about keeping the baby with the family, and so a lot of things had changed, and they had really addressed some of the, you know, the separation concerns and other concerns that women, you know, who were having babies have when they used to go to the hospital. So a lot of that has been addressed. If I were to do it today, I would go to a hospital, both for those reasons, because I'm old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It would be a miracle if I were to become pregnant anyway, but at my age, I would have to do that anyway. And because things have improved, but that varies from area to area, and not every woman is going to be running into these same, you know, this uniform kind of best-case scenario. Right. It's hey, you're not very old, you're experienced. Up. What's that? I said you're not old. You're experienced. I'm very experienced. That counts right. for a lot. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the, um, I don't know if this is all over, but the hospital that my daughter gave birth in, they don't have a nursery anymore. And you have that baby 24-7. And mm -hmm. as, as the old school, another experienced person, um, I was just, I thought, how can they not have a nursery? Because... She had a C-section, and, you know, you mm -hmm. can barely turn over. 
Right. And here this adorable little baby in the in the little uh, isolate was next to her. And you're supposed to turn over and pick up the baby and feed the baby. And you can just about turn. And it's interesting because they've also changed some of the rules. Like the nurses are not allowed to take the baby or they're not allowed to really. They can hand the baby. Mm-hmm. You know, and if, if, if you're trying to breastfeed, they'll send somebody to help if, it, if you're having a difficult time. But they are not allowed to really do big time help and I think my god you go through this whole delivery and you can't even sleep for 10 minutes so (laughs) I I (laughs) just I like having the nursery (laughs) (laughs) and that comes down to everybody has different you know we all have we come to it with different intentions and different needs I mean yes having a c-section and the aftermath of that is going to be different from having a vaginal birth and you know your ability to lift your baby is going to be very different all of these other factors come into what people are going what's going to be best fit for the family definitely you know and i was i was thinking they ought to there was no room like if somebody said can you help us they would go no we're not allowed you know these are our rules for our job and they've changed things and it's tough because how do you decide which rules work and which don't work and you know and you say, okay, well, I'll do this, but don't tell anybody, but you're so tired. Or, you know what, it's yeah. it's it's interesting. And it's a lot of work from the nurse's standpoint, too. You know what, you ring and you want your baby every five minutes, which you want to hold your baby and they're doing something else. It, it's tough to try to figure out what to do nowadays. And, you know, I'm glad you talked about the home delivery because a lot of people just love it, but I like the centers. I, I'm so happy to hear the way I'm calling it a center, what you said, but it's nice mm-hmm. to have all that support. Right. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, the home birth thing is so fraught, you know, and contentious, but, you know, there's definitely a level of risk, especially for a woman who's having her first child. There appears to be, you know, a level of risk that any woman who's making this decision has to accept. And um, from what I could tell, and this is just me personally, that, you know, if you're planning on a home birth and you want to maximize safety while you're still doing that, you need a certified nurse midwife, you need a hospital within minutes, and you need obstetrician backup because, as you know, you know, birth is incredibly unpredictable, and things can yeah. go just really pear shaped in a matter of seconds. So <clears throat> it yeah. is a matter of seconds, but you know what? Everybody needs to do what works, and if that's what yeah. works for you, it's great. And I love those tips. And make sure you do have everybody in line, mm-hmm. because also it'll make you calmer. You know, when you're doing the delivery, it's not so easy to deliver a baby if you know you have that medical support as well as the emotional support, and everything's in order. You don't have to think the what ifs. What if this happens? What am I going to do? You have it all set up, just like with anything that we do. It's nice to plan when we can and right. be safe about everything. We're going to go to our another commercial break, and when we come back, we are going to talk to Emily from the author of The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first years, and I'm going to ask her her favorite parenting tip. So be ready. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with more help My Baby Came Without Instructions. It's Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lippman on Toginet. We'll be right back right after these. Welcome to Geraldine Tegelove Live, the show that shares with you the secrets of redefining, reinventing, and rebuilding your life. Having pulled herself from the rubble of financial ruin and having gone on to create a highly successful career, Geraldine has become an expert in the art of transformation. She believes that it doesn't matter where you are right now, how overwhelmed you feel, or how impossible the task of turning your life around may seem. You can do it. Stay tuned as metaphysician, international best-selling author and intuitive, Geraldine Tegelov gives you the inner understanding and the outer practical how-to to to create your amazing life. Gain a fresh perspective on how to redefine, reinvent, and rebuild your life. Join Geraldine Tegelov live every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on the Toginet Radio Network. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert Annette Hammond. Whether you are a man, woman, boy, or girl, 
Lifting weights is an important component to your exercise program. LiftStrong says that challenging your body with different exercises and routines helps keep your workout interesting and effective. Make sure that when you're lifting weights, you are working to fatigue or failure to get the most benefits. When lifting weights, reaching failure means that you could not possibly do one more rep. Your muscle has failed. Fatigue means you can barely do one or two more repetitions and keep your good form. If your workout is too easy and you're not reaching failure or fatigue, it's time to lift heavier weights. Be aware that your form is vital and reaching fatigue or failure is much more important than hitting a certain number of repetitions. I'm Annette Hammond. Like us on Facebook at Fitness Minute with Annette Hammond. Welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions with Bly Flipman on Toginet. The hour for all moms with little ones to come for great advice, encouragement, and great ideas for all new parents. Now, back to the show with Bly Flipman. Well, welcome back to Baby and Toddler Instructions. We are up to the last part of the show. It goes so quickly. I'm here with Emily Willingham, the author of The Informed Parent, science-based resource for your child's first year, four years, and it is an amazing book. I mean, I, I was changing my bookmarks. During the break, I was looking. There's so many things I want to ask about, and I definitely want to have Emily come back. Um, before we go on, tell my listeners where they can get your book. Um, it is available because I've gone and looked. It's available in just your standard bookstores. Independent booksellers are carrying it, and then it's available also on Amazon and online at Barnes and Noble. Isn't so it everywhere. Great? Isn't it great to go look at your own book? Yes, it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> you go take a picture and take a selfie with your book. I would do that with my book. It was so much fun. <laughs> it's a ton of fun. Yeah. Are you going to be on Audible? This would be a great Audible book. I, we're, we've been asked that, and we asked our publisher, and that's still something that's under discussion, apparently. So, well, I yeah. say yay, so tell your publisher yes. A lot of people <laughs> like to listen while they're working out or driving. or. Heck yeah, yeah. Anyway, really. I, I will tell. I will let them know. Um, do you have a favorite parenting tip? Um, actually, I have a couple. I hope two is okay. One is that's about the fun. parent, and one is about the child. And so my, my favorite parenting tip is, and this is about parents, is that, you know, you, a lot of the time, barely enough is good enough. Just let it go. <laughs> so I think people strive for perfection. They overthink. They worry too much. And I really do think that, you know, when it comes to parenting, sometimes just getting the barely enough is fine. <laughs> you could I be love okay. that. Because you know what? The next day you look at something and you go, well, that wasn't so much. Yeah. Why was I stressing about it? Why was I overthinking it? that so much, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then the other one is just about the child. I think parents, maybe some parents, especially when, the, and this, I've certainly, I did this with our first child, I'm sure, is that I think we forget that our children are individuals and they, just like we do, they have their own likes and dislikes and things that bother them and things that they love. And I think it's really important to remember that your child is a complete separate individual human being and to respect that as much as possible in your parenting. You know, I love those tips and especially the individual, you know, you have, you have boys, I'm sure they're different. I have a boy and a girl and they're so different Mm -hmm. and they're Mm -hmm. so wonderful. And it's so interesting to see the differences in them. So great tips. Thank you for that. I love to ask my guests their favorite tips. Um, You were talking about vitamin K during the break. Can you share some of that? Yeah, um, I think I mentioned that I, my my younger sister is about to give birth any minute now. Apparently, we're not quite sure, but you know it's coming up, and so she has our book, and she was reading through it. And this is her fourth child; this is not her first rodeo. And but she was reading through it, and she got to the vitamin K shot part, and she's like, "Oh, that's what the vitamin K shot." does i'm so glad to have read this and so i'm thinking wow this is great even with experienced parents there's something here for people to learn and what the vitamin k shot does is it makes up for the fact that so vitamin k is a clotting factor it ensures that your blood clots and so if you have a problem with bleeding and there are three ways that infants especially can have this problem arise um, vitamin k will ensure that you clot and so you don't bleed too much especially if a tiny baby you know that could be horrible and so when babies are born, they don't have vitamin K. It doesn't really cross from the mother to the child. And so they're usually deficient in vitamin K, and the shot just sort of bridges that until they start getting it more in their diets and things like that. 
Do they do that? Do do most of the hospitals do that? Yeah, I believe so. I, I'm trying to cast my mind back when I was, you know, going through that. I was thinking, did we do that? And I'm pretty sure we did um, for all three of our sons, but I cannot for the life of me remember now. No, I can't remember either. Yeah, I don't yeah, remember now, but I, yeah, it's pre- I think it's a standard of care. So yeah. well, That's good to hear. Also, you have on page 155, parents ask me all the time, why is my baby crying? Why do babies cry? And, you know, some, and, and grandma says, don't pick them up, you're going to spoil them. And then oh, the other boy. grandma says, no, pick them up, you can never spoil them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually, you know, with little, with little bitty babies, it's not possible to spoil a, a child under, you know, a couple of years of age. You right, just can't. I agree. They, they, they're not, they don't have the, <laughs> the brain structures in place to be manipulative or to be spoiled. They just have needs. And so, you know, your job is to meet those needs. And so when they're crying, your job is to figure out why. And I think it helps to think, well, why would I be crying? And if I couldn't talk, you know, and I'm trying to let someone know, you're cold, you're wet, you're uncomfortable, you have gas pain, you're hungry, you're really sleepy, but you can't get to sleep. I mean, there are all of these reasons that they might be crying, and you can have this little list of things that you go through to try to sort of address each of those reasons and see if you can provide some comfort. And sometimes they're just, I guess, they're sad, I don't know, and they cry. (laughs) The best you can do is just kind of hold them while they cry. It's true, and you don't always know why they cry. You know no. what? And that's okay. Sometimes we cry, yeah. and we don't know why we're crying. Exactly. You know what? You know, so maybe cry. they're just having a bad day. That's right. <laughs> so, so they're crying. <laughs> and it's okay. And it's okay for yeah. you to cry, too. Yeah, It doesn't exactly. mean that you're having postpartum depression, which is another thing you talked about in your book. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a significant condition. And, yeah, having a little bit of blues here and there as your you know, hormones adjust, and you adjust to having a completely new person in your house. I mean, that's a big deal. All of that is completely typical. But, you know, if there's a depth to it and a persistence to it and you're having thoughts that you're uncomfortable with and that kind of stuff, it's really important to you know, consult a medical professional and talk to them about it. Right, and there's no shame. You know what? No, Make gosh, a phone no, call absolutely and, not. And ask. I, You'll feel better. Everybody will feel better, and it's yes. okay. Um, since we're talking about parenting and choices and letting them cry and not cry, what do you, what's your advice when parents have meet opposition with other people? I would never do that, or you should do this. <laughs> you know, those things that you want to say, don't talk to me. I'm so tired. You know, I think it depends on your relationship with the person who's saying that and how courteous you feel like you need to be with that person. (laughs) I mean, I've had total strangers, you know, say things that were clearly judging about choices I was making for my children, and I just kind of ignore those people because who are they? I don't know them. Um, If it's, you know, someone with whom I'm friends or a family member, that's something where you tread more lightly and you say, you know, this is the choice that I've made and I'm making this choice based on, you know, evidence that's available to me and what's best fit for us. So, you know, that's what I'm going to keep doing. But thanks. You know, yeah, I, there's not, yeah. It's the I thanks. Don't, yeah. It's the thanks. I think we have to remember people are well-meaning, and maybe that's what worked for them when they were baby. And, you know, yeah. you just say thanks, and remember it's coming from a place in their heart, and you, then it, you have to is. do what works. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, but... I think with family members, a lot of the time it really is, especially with, like, grandmas and things. You know, their they're, they're, they're thing is, like, I did this with you, and look, you're great. I love you. You're my child, and I love you. And, I'm, you know, and so you think, thanks, Grandma. That's really great advice. I appreciate that. You don't have to get pugnacious about it. But if it's a total stranger judging you on the playground, you know that's going to be a different situation. When you were researching this book, anything really surprising that hit? With you and Tara? Um, I would say that for me the surprising thing was that, and I guess not really surprising in retrospect at all, but when you look at the studies, so many of them focus just on the mother and child, and I think it's because, you know, socially mother and child are the ones who are expected to spend all of that early time together, and there's not as much about the father or the partner role in um, these family situations and as, as you know that's becoming coming more and more to the fore and fathers and partners becoming more and more engaged in you know in what's going on with the baby and helping with the baby and you know parenting all night long too and they're tired and all this other stuff and so I think there's probably a big opening there for more research into that kind of thing. 
and yeah. what happens between partners when you have a new baby, which gets right. pretty, as you know, can be tense. Because they've left, you know, they have left daddy out a bit, and there's so many stay-at-home dads now. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty interesting because, you know, mom will look to the dad. You know, dads, dads do things a little different, and it's great because you have two ways. Dads feel different. Uh, dads feel different to the baby. You know, their hands are bigger, and it's just pretty interesting. Um, let's see. We have about one minute. What else do you want to share? You have a minute on anything in the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's gotten me stuck. I would say screens. Um, the the jury on screens is still out for a lot of things, but not the bottom line is probably no screens when they're very young. But having exposure here and there to television, especially interactive television shows, seems to be just fine. And you know, we'll have to wait for more research to roll in on things like iPads and all of that kind of stuff. But it's not something to lose your mind about if no. your child has screen exposure and that kind of thing. It's not going to be the end of the world. Well, great way to end the show because screen time is a big one now for all of us. So, mm-hmm. Emily, thank you so much for being on the show. I definitely want to have you come back because there's so much more to talk about. And I will put all your information on my website, The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first four years. And pet that dog for me. She didn't even bark. <laughs> do. So you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Right. Take care. You too. Wow, Bye-bye. so much great information. Um, next week, my guest will be Dr. Robert Melillo. He wrote a wonderful book called The Disconnected Kids Nutrition Plan. And we're going to be talking to the doctor all about foods and nutrition and how they affect your child's learning. And even when they're babies, you know, how, where do you start? Do you start with vegetables? Do you start with fruit? You know, things change constantly. So Dr. Melillo will be on my show. And don't forget to follow me on Facebook. Please like my pages, Baby Instructions, and My Best Parenting Advice. I'm on Twitter. Check out my website, mybestparentingadvice.com. Um, I do articles, and again, I always have the up-to-date recalls, and I have experts on my website. So I'd like to leave you today with a little parent humor. Are you ready for this? Some days it feels a little bit more like hostage negotiating with a band of drunken pirates and actual parenting. Boy, I can remember those days, even now. And respect your parents. They graduated without Google. And finally, you never know how inappropriate song lyrics lyrics are until you hear your child singing them. Boy, even little ones, I, I have to share this really quickly. I remember being in a dressing room, and next to me was a little girl. She must have been about three, and she was singing a song, and she, the swear words in it, and I could see her feet going up and down. She was rapping, and I thought, my goodness, what are you letting your child listen to? It was so hysterical, but it made my day. Little ones are so cute, so you'll know those lyrics when your little one starts singing them. Anyway, I'm so happy you could tune in today. Thanks so much. I want you all to have a great rest of your week. Enjoy your babies, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.